Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Bill Bullington with Mike Razor. <laughs> Got Michael Razor with me in the office here today, and I want to thank him for uh, coming on the show today, Mike. It's good to see you here. My pleasure, Bill. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. And uh, Mike is a, uh, an attorney, and he's with a firm you might, you may or may not recognize, but probably probably should. Cabot Familia and Dirk, and they've been in the Cleveland for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I met Mike because he was handling some real estate transactions for me. <clears throat> and he does a lot of other stuff that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show. Uh, but one of the reasons that I wanted to get him on is we're trying to convince him to go ahead and run for office. <laughs> 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 and uh, um, you would be running, uh, I, you know, I didn't bother asking you, it would be on a Republican platform um, or is it independent? That's correct. Just for the your listeners' background. I'm the president of city council in Stowe. Okay. Uh, we've got 35,000 people there. Uh, I've been recruited for about the past year to run for state representative in that district. Uh, the district goes from uh, Monroe Falls, Silver Lake, Stowe, Hudson, all the way up to the Cuyahoga County border with Twinsburg, Macedonia, and Northfield. Um, so yeah, I would be a Repu I am a Republican. I would be on the Republican ticket. Uh, we still have not made an announcement, but uh, things would be looking very good. I think we'd be the front runner if that did happen. Okay. Well, that, that's awesome. Yeah. So, and the, the things that we talked about, you know, just before coming on air here, I, I find really interesting. I think would probably resonate well with a lot of people. Uh, just, you talked a little bit about fiscal resp responsibility. I don't think you, you called it that, but the, uh, it was the same thing. I think, uh, government's being responsible with the money that you're spending. That's absolutely right, Bill. That's one of the things I'm passionate about. I, I ran for city council for the first time when I was 24 years old. I was still in law school. Um, so what, what inspires somebody who's got their own you know, law school uh, activities to, to run for office? Well, I was reading the paper a lot, and I was seeing that they were wasting our tax dollars. And uh, you know, I, I knew my uh, parents worked really hard for the income that they made, and so did my neighbors and my friends. And uh, I thought it was a travesty that the government could just squander that money. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they, they go to the effort of writing letters to the editor. They, they complain about it. But I felt like I was in a position where I could express that message and make real change. So we're sitting here now, eight years later, Bill, and uh, the city of Stowe has, we went from uh, million-dollar deficits. Now we're running surpluses. We had $31 million in debt. Now we have $17 million in debt. Wow. So it, it's it's a testament to people that, that you don't have to have special skills or, or background to make a big difference in government. Yeah. Yeah. And that's awesome. And I know that's, uh, uh, I used to sell before I got in this business, I sold marketing services. And one of the services that we had was a magazine that went out to government buyers and it went out to government buyers at all levels. Uh, you have buyers, planners, and specifiers, uh, in government agencies, typically spec writers, tell you what type of product that you can get. You, I'm, you're probably familiar with all that stuff. But um, yeah, it was interesting to see just how much money was spent, how it was spent. Uh, I really didn't like the idea of spending all the money in your budget because you wouldn't get it back again the next year. Travesty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. that, that, that was uh, <laughs> was one of those things that popped up and I was going, wow, you know, that, that, that doesn't seem right. Uh, anyway, so I think that's a that that's a really good platform, and I think every state, every every government uh, agency, any big organization actually uh, can do a better job. They all know they can. I, you know, it's not a we're not telling untold secrets here. But uh, well, one thing that's crazy is that we've we reduced our workforce by twenty percent, and we've been on a hiring freeze for eight years, and yet we could still maintain the same level of service. Right. I think that that's a, a trend or a, a technique that could work widespread throughout the country and save significant amount of tax, tax dollars, which will allow people to have more money in their pockets. Yeah, And, and that's, that's the goal of government is to make things better for the people. Sure. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's, that is actually the path that the government should take. You don't need to cut 
back, you can freeze, freeze it because just what you just said and what I've experienced in, in my industry is that you can do more things with fewer people now because the tools that they're using are better. Now they might have to get trained on it, but it's still less expensive to train somebody who's already doing a job than it would be to hire new people to the same job that you could get done uh, more efficiently. So yeah, that, that's a, uh, uh, I feel pretty strongly about that. Uh, the government debt to GDP ratio is actually not as high as it was after World War II. So we're not in emergency situation in an emergency situation yet. The difference is that an enormous amount of the debt is owed to Social Security and Medicare, uh, and it's non-interest bearing, uh, which is really interesting because if they started charging interest on that, then uh, Medicare, you know, you'd have to be 90 before you could start collecting. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the the way out is to, you don't have to cut spending, just freeze spending, or, uh, or even just slow the increases down by half. So you take half of that out. And the economy will grow. Uh, it's growing now. First time in you know nine years, it's actually been above three percent again. Right. Um, but Gro- growth is huge. I think we have to grow. Spending cuts alone cannot bring us into a reasonable debt situation. There has to be growth. You can yep. you can finagle the numbers any way you want, but uh, you can't raise taxes to get out of it. You can't cut spending entirely to get out of it. You have to you have to grow. Sure. And there has and government plays a huge role in growth or inhibiting growth. It does. In, in my own industry, yeah. Bill, um, you know, as I help clients, I can tell you that that I that government regulations and laws are oftentimes holding companies back from hiring, from expanding, and uh, that's a that's a real shame. And I, and I think that there's, in my experience, there's there are very few people in government who aren't well intentioned. So new laws and new regulations, everybody says, you know what, this is going to help people. But it's a lot of the people don't think beyond the first level of consequences. Right, right, yeah, that absolutely. So uh, when I uh, when we're talking about this, I'm I'm just excited to have you here again. His name is Michael Razor, and if you want to hear this again, you can actually go to iTunes, download the uh, Bullington Capital podcast. You can uh, go to the Fish nine nine five five the Fish. This is played as a podcast there too. If you want to know more about him, because uh, I think it's pretty fascinating. The other thing I think is fascinating now that we've talked about the uh, the political stuff, and uh, again, uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, get my younger brother, who's the three hundred pound chiropractor that signed with the Dallas Cowboys, might have to get him to come up here and put Mike in the headlock and make him run in the election. <laughs> but the uh, but one of the things that Mike does, and I think we're going to try to try to get him back on the show, is uh, helps f- uh, firms raise funds. I get calls. I used to get calls constantly on that. And I think at some point in time, because I'd answered so many of the calls, that uh, they've slowed down because I've talked about you know me not being able to do that unless they were registered securities. But now that I have another out, <laughs> so Mike is uh, involved in that. And I think that's, that's pretty fascinating because we get asked that quite often at, at my company. People are looking to raise money to start a business. Uh, and you're, you've been very proactive in that field. And uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, let me give you the general framework uh, for your listeners of securities laws, securities are law. Securities are are basically any sort of venture or any sort of opportunity that you sell that has upside that that somebody else is controlling. Um, and I, that's so nebulous. Let me kind of keep going to explain it. Um, stocks are securities. Um, partnership interests can be securities. LLC interests can be securities, and they're regulated both at the federal and the state level. And generally speaking, you cannot sell securities unless there is an exemption or you are registered. Um, The exemptions at the federal level, uh, the most common one is Regulation D. Maybe people know it as Reg D. And uh, basically that's for a private securities offering. And that's a lot of what I do is help people who are trying to raise money fit inside of Reg D. And if you fit inside of Reg D, oftentimes you're also going to fit inside of the state securities exemption uh, under the state of Ohio law. That's that's the basic framework. Okay, so if somebody had an idea, they wanted to build a hotel, but they didn't have the money to do it themselves, and they didn't want to go to the bank because the bank's probably going to turn them down, uh, they could call you, you could consult with them about how to properly 
form that that entity and how to talk to people about raising the money? Absolutely. That's something I do pretty commonly. Um, and the first question is, where do, you, where do you see the source of money coming from? Do you see it as coming from friends and family in Ohio? Do you see it coming from people in New York, California, Texas? Is each, each state that you deal with, you have to de- deal with their state securities laws. Mm-hmm. And there's some states that have very restrictive securities laws, like the state of New York. Um, I'd never advise a client not to seek money where they can seek money just because of the laws. But if there's a if it's a toss up and you can go to New York to raise money, you can go to, uh, let's say, Indiana to raise money. There's no question you go to Indiana because New York has such strict regulations. They're so they're so strict, in fact, that there's some question within New York whether they're even enforceable. Right. But nobody <laughs> takes you don't take that risk because right. no one wants to get hit with a huge securities fine. Right. Yeah. And that that is a big I get questions over the years. I've gotten a lot of questions on this. And uh, now I know who to uh, refer them to. That That's going to be awesome. And there are some really good businesses. And there, there's some businesses you read about in The Plain Dealer. You've seen them on television. They've started here, local incubators. And uh, these guys have started businesses and gone on to do really good things. A lot like the uh, Shark Tank companies. Um, but uh, they evidently found somebody that uh, did the paperwork for them. Um, you might recognize a couple firms that started out that way. Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's was an intrastate offering, uh, which is a, another thing that you and I had talked about. Uh, it does make it a lot easier if you raise all the money from Ohio, or it, it did in the past. I don't know. I might be speaking out of turn here and not uh, inaccurate, inaccurately. But uh, so it was easier to raise money in your own state than it was to get cleared to go to other states uh, as well. That's correct. Uh, if you do not cross state borders with your offers or sales, uh, you don't have to deal with federal regulations, which is a big help. And if the state in which you're offering is has a set of um, business-friendly regulations, you may even be able to advertise your securities within that state. Um, unfortunately, the state of Ohio is not one of those states. Um, so if I were to run uh, for a state office, that's the kind of thing that I would want to, you know, the kind of way I would take my business expertise and hopefully make the state a better place. Right. Because I think everyone agrees that small business should have access to capital. Sure. And I also think that it's sort of an antiquated thought that we have to protect investors um, at every turn because it, to some extent it's got to be buyer beware. Right. In a perfect world, yes, we have we eliminate all opportunities for fraud. Well, but I got news for people. <laughs> I, you know, I look at financial statements every day. <laughs> and the financial statement is a picture of something that happened in the past that has been touched up. <laughs> so you're still operating on trust even when you have audits, SEC audits, uh, New York Stock Exchange comes in audits if you're listed on the exchange. Uh, you've got your local uh, authorities that come in and do audits. There's still a huge element of, of trust involved, in, uh, but I, I get your point. Yeah, and especially with these smaller offerings, uh, things can happen. Uh, a lot of unexpected things, and you know sometimes a business goes bad, uh, but other times businesses do really, really well. And I think if a lot of people knew about that and uh, uh, or had some place to go, that that would certainly help. I love the idea of reducing the regulations around things like that. Uh, you know, you have to know that you're taking risk when you invest in someone's business. Uh, and this is when you do it this way, you're a direct investor in that business. And the, the, your investment will do well or not do well, depending on how well that business does. Sure. And uh, a lot of times, you know, some uh, occasionally some bad stuff happens, but occasionally some really good stuff happens. And I think the Ben and Jerry story was a riot. Uh, the, the book that they wrote was uh, I thought was hilarious. Uh, they were being sued by one of their I think it was a vendor. Or I can't remember who it was. But they didn't think they were going to lose. They thought it was, you know, there's no way they're going to lose. It's their attorney saying, yeah, we're going to be in there 45 minutes and out. Well, anyway, they ended up having to uh, ask for a, uh, a small break, small recess. Uh, they went into a conference room because the uh, suit was going against them badly. It looked like they were going to lose and, and have to pay this judgment. And uh, 
it was either Ben or Jerry that, that decided to go. I think they flipped a quarter, and they had to get in their van that they were delivering the ice cream in. That they had a suit, uh, It was a Volkswagen that they had rigged a freezer in to deliver the ice cream <laughs> they were making. And they had to go down to the bank. The, the bank gave them the currency, the cash to clean out their account, and they had to take it. You had to drive across state line and open an, a new account so that they couldn't <laughs> get the money. And they, uh, uh, of course, he did, and th- they went back to court. The, George, uh, the judge ruled against them. They ran down to the bank, tried to get the money. The money wasn't there. <laughs> so, And then they were going to have to go across state lines to try to get which was another whole set of uh, uh, endeavors and uh, legal expenses. So by the time that had happened, they had, they had appealed and, and won and could bring the money back. Oh, my gosh. That's what we call a fraudulent transfer, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't, don't advise any of, the, any right. of your uh, listeners to pull that one off. Yeah, well, it was in their book. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, I thought that was a riot, though. That is funny. And uh, it could have been the end of Ben and Jerry's, you know, right right there. That would have been the uh, last you'd ever seen them. So stuff happens, you know. I remember uh, this is not a small company, but uh, Dell, back in the early 90s, <laughs> people tell me they want to trade currencies, uh, which, uh, you know, you'll you'll find out if you trade any Bitcoin, uh, just, just how volatile that's going to be. And Dell wanted to trade currencies because they were doing a billion dollars a year in foreign business. And this is back in the early 90s, back when, you know, billion was more than it is today, for sure. And uh, I thought it was uh, really wild. They lost so much money that the uh, the, the company nearly collapsed. He had uh, lost an incredible amount of money, and uh, they had to shut that down completely. Now, they were selling computers in all those countries that they were trading the currencies in. So you would have thought that they would have had some knowledge. <laughs> and Michael Dell's going, hey, you know, we got to the point where I was wondering if our checks were going to start bouncing. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that so. takes us back to the, the point about investing in a small business or a, a, a startup venture. You can't make it your bread and butter right. um, because it's it's something that should should provide some upside to what you're doing. Um, and that's something that's that, that the federal government recognized with the Jumpstart Our, Our Small Businesses Act uh, that was passed under uh, Republican Congress signed by President Obama and has to a great deal opened up federal securities laws um, that that a, a young in, or a, uh, an investor, a mom and pop investor should not be pouring all of their life savings right. into these ventures. Absolutely. And now that I hear the music, we got to take a real quick commercial break. You're listening to Bill Bullington and Michael Razor right here on 1420 The Answer. Stay tuned because we'll be right back. And we're back. You're listening to Bill Bullington, owner of Bullington Capital Management, and Mike Razor. He's an attorney with Cabbage Familia and Durkin, considering running for office. And uh, now which office is it again, Mike? I'm presently the president of city council in Stowe. I'd, okay. uh, I've been recruited to run for state representative as a Republican in the 37th district, which is basically all of Northeast Summit County. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, try to twist his arm as much as we can here. <laughs> you, you you probably won't have a commitment before the end of the show, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we'll work on it. <laughs> but he's got some really good ideas. Uh, I think that uh, they would really help. And if those ideas were ever to get a lot of support, go viral, so to speak, throughout the uh, the government, the uh, it would be a big improvement, a big improvement. And uh, I think it's very interesting that you talked about uh, people being able to do more. And, and that's true. I can tell you that uh, there are three of us that work every day at, at my company and there are two off site. But just the three of us, the amount of, of work that we do uh, would have taken months. The amount of work that we do sometimes in a single day would have taken months. Because when we rebalance, go through a major rebalance of all the clients' accounts, uh, there's anywhere between eight to 10,000 transactions. Eight to ten thousand. Okay, we used to have to write a, a piece of paper for each and every one of those. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now it's all on. Uh, it's all computerized. Uh, so it literally it yeah it takes a better part of a day 
you know, but, uh, but that's about it. And now uh, back to work. So, um, as if that's not work, <laughs> that's actually high stress work, but the, uh, uh, anyway, you can do a lot more. And, and I've always held that you should be able to, if you if you just slowed the spending down or froze the spending, you can do it because you've got enough, there are enough technical tools in most of them, not everything, but uh, most of them you can uh, actually do more with fewer people, uh, more automation. And uh, you would actually, as the economy grows, the debt as a percent of GDP starts to come down and just naturally. Uh, and it's probably the least painful way of reducing the debt as a percentage of your economy. And uh, that in the long run is really what matters most. Absolutely. The, the debt is something that is, as a 32-year-old, uh, concerns me because this is basically one generation putting things on a credit card and expecting the next generation to pay it. Yeah. Um, so we need to start putting these things into play now right? so that in 30 years we're not looking at a, a having to raise taxes to a confiscatory level or just print a bunch of money, as, as they call it, helicopter money, and just right. dropping it down from the Fed. Well, that's – and unfortunately – you know, if it's not handled sometime over the next decade or so, and that's probably what's going to happen because that is the easiest solution. It's to print the money. Um, I call inflation the silent thief. The uh, prices go up. Why do prices go up? Because they keep printing money and circulating that money and extending credit. And, you know, it, it does work, but the result is that the uh, cost of goods goes up and it creeps up. In the 1970s, it wasn't creeping up. Uh, the uh, I forget which department it was back then. It used to track that, but it's probably the Federal Reserve. They they came out and they adjusted. They said inflation was only eight nine percent, and then 13 years uh, later, they did a review and said, "Oh no, it was actually closer to 13, which means it was 15." <laughs> <laughs> And when the price of a home was doubling in four or five years, the same home was you could sell for 100% more. That's not a 9 or 10% inflation rate. No. That's not even 13%. Uh, it's closer to 15%. And that's what happened. Uh, there was a program that many people are familiar with today. It's called Medicare. Okay. Medicare was, was started. It's a great thing. I think it's a, 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 an excellent program. It takes up, it's the largest budget item, by the way, the federal government. But they didn't, create a tax to pay for it. So <laughs> instead, they started doing this new thing with this new theory called monetary theory. <laughs> it was new at that time. Nobody, Milton Friedman and all those, those guys were not nearly as popular as they were going to be. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they figured out that, hey, you know what? Um, we'll just fire up the printing presses and print that money. <laughs> mm-hmm. We'll pay for that stuff. And so what happened was, uh, that was just one of the, the cause. There were a lot of contributing factors. There always are. But the uh, but that was a major contributing factor. And it caused the uh, uh, inflation rate to get really, really high. So while people thought that they were getting a really good return on their investments, they were actually negative. They were purchasing less a year after they'd had it and then paid tax on the interest, by the way, which was very high at the time. Yeah, it was worth less a year from now than it, or, or a year after they'd made those investments and gotten paid the interest and then paid their taxes than it was the, the year before that they had uh, invested the money. And that went on for about 12 years. Uh, and that is what I would like to avoid like the plague, if possible. Absolutely. And uh, so we need guys like you <laughs> that understand that concept that can go in and say, hey, you know, it, the answers are there. We do have the answers. You have a, a pro-growth policies. Uh, you don't regulate industries out of existence, the, uh, especially industries that can help your economy by employing people, uh, growing themselves, changing. And uh, you just don't continue to spend on the, in the same fashion that you've been spending, even if you just slowed it down. If you slowed the increases down, if you put a hiring freeze, the, uh, those are things that are relatively easy to do, relatively painless. You know, every year, the, the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States is 62 and over. Every day, 10,000 people turn 62. That means 10,000 people are eligible for Social Security <laughs> every day. So the, uh, um, they're retiring from somewhere. A lot of them are retiring from government jobs. So if you're, if you're just not replacing it, and by the way, the kids that are replacing the 62-year-olds are a lot faster on computers than they were. 
for sure. <laughs> I mean, you should look at our law firm. Uh, the, the, se- the secretary use that I have is very minimal compared to somebody who's in their 60s who yeah. has the secretary type up letters and do bills. And like I do I do all that myself because I'm yeah. so much faster at yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, would, it, would, it would slow you down to have to take that to someone else to type that up for you. Exactly, yeah. and that's a good illustration of the point you're making. Yeah, so it can be done. And uh, hope springs eternal. <laughs> that's that's what I've been hoping for since I got out of college. But because uh, you know, and actually PCs were a lot slower back then too. The uh, th- they were PCs. <laughs> <laughs> actually, they called a, a laptop a portable computer. They didn't. There was no such thing as a laptop. It was this great big piece of equipment that you had to carry around. It weighed about thirty pounds, <laughs> and uh, probably even more than that. But uh, anyway, so. Economies are always changing. Op- opportunities come and go. The uh, technology is always going to be with us. Uh, it's going to change. It's going to change the way we live. It already has. It's continuing to do that. That creates opportunities. Uh, and boy, if you can just get the wherewithal to, to see some of that and seize it, uh, when I, that that's my dream. That That's utopia as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and we've had instances like that in the past. Uh, I don't know if uh, people know, but Fairchild Semiconductor, the, the parent company of Intel, was a government ain't entity. So the semiconductor was actually paid for by government tax dollars. That turned out pretty good. <laughs> the cell phone that you have, there's a chip in there that's made by a company, or the patents uh, are owned by a company called Qualcomm. You may have heard of them. The uh, That was designed uh, for the CIA uh, because you can't... Uh, intercept the call and hear what's being said if you don't have the encryption codes. And so they're secure. And what's, that was all funded by the government. Government funded 100% of that. And uh, they were not, they're not allowed to own those businesses, so they ended up having to spin them out at some point in time in some way, shape, or form, or fashion. But uh, so I thought that was pretty cool, too. And uh, it had a bunch of other uses at the time. And uh, it's amazing. I'm sure they never thought that they were going to go this route with it, but they, they knew uh, that the capability, what the capabilities were uh, back then, it was just a really secure way to make a phone call, and it was a little cheaper. It was all digital, and uh, in fact, they had a really tough time selling it to other entities uh, in the United States. There was a competing technology that almost crushed it, and the competing technology is not as good, by the way. It's still around too, uh, and uh, so this guy took. The uh, patents, he sent a guy over to Russia because the United States isn't buying it. The CIA is buying it. They love it. And uh, uh, by the way, when you give them their own encryption codes, they don't have your codes. uh, So they're they're still not able to pick up your phone calls. And the salesman's calling on the the KGB there. And uh, I just read this in a, in a, a newspaper, by the way. So being, you know. Before you had the internet, the fake news were, were it was on paper. <laughs> so I have to disclaim this story. But anyway, they were trying to sell it to him, and they, he was telling them, look, you can't unencrypt, you can't de- intercept these calls and know what people are saying on their cell phones. It's impossible. And they were saying, yeah, 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 very nice. No. So they send him away. He goes to his hotel room, and he's calling back to the United States, and that they can't decode his call. <laughs> so they arrest him as a spy. <laughs> he goes back and he's going, no, this is what I was trying to tell you. You can't. <laughs> so Russia orders a ton of, of these products. And uh, after that, China, and uh, I think when they cut the deal in China, uh, that was like a big catalyst. That stock had gone nowhere, just a, a 40% range for almost three years. All my clients that were in on that were uh, were really upset with me. And I'm just, you got to just hang on, just hang on. That company, while we owned it, it went from 300 million to 800 million to 1.3 billion in sales. And the share price was, was down about 40% from uh, where some people had purchased the stock. So now nah, you just, that's there. It's a stock. That's the way they work, especially a stock like this that nobody really knows much about, uh, except for the people that are getting run over their competitors right now. $1.3 billion in the grand scheme of things is not a, a huge number, but how fast they got there is. They were the only company. They, they grew faster than Cisco Systems, uh, and you're probably a little too young to remember that, but uh, Cisco Systems grew like crazy. Cisco Systems created or, or actually popularized the technology you might recognize today as blockchain. Sure. That's how the Internet yeah. works, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and now they're calling it something new as if it's different. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an old technology. Why do people forget? 
the uh, I guess uh, I, I forget a lot as they get older. But <laughs> well, they're, they're, the new thing is they're using blockchain to create money out of nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, another quick story. I don't know how close we are to a break. It might take a minute to yeah, explain, sure. but um, that involves government involvement in private enterprise. That probably goes contrary to, to the story, or at least a counterexample of how government can sometimes get its fingers in places mm-hmm. that that hinder growth. Right. Um, you see the government now funding a lot of green technology, whether through tax credits or otherwise. And you have, of course, a cylinder example that fell flat on its face of the past, uh, the previous decade. Um, if you look back a hundred years, they had a similar problem with with uh, that, that we have today, which was that horse horses was the main right. were the main way of transportation. And they were looking to transition out of that for a multitude of, of reasons. Obviously, manure is not a great thing to have sitting around your streets. Right. Um, and if, if the government had gotten involved 100 years ago, there's no question the government would have funded the steam engine as the alternative to the horse. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, it, and if the government had done that, the, the internal combustion engine would not have taken off. And you'd have a completely different world today than you do. Yes. And so yeah. I'm... I use that example as a, as a reason to say the free market in, is really the method and the mechanism right. for growth. And that when the government tries to pick what technology or what, or even worse, what companies will deliver that technology, um, you're going to have, you're, you're not, you're going to distort the free market process and you may not arrive at the most efficient or oh, yeah, prosperous yeah. result. Yeah, and and it's never going to. And the government is no better than a private equity firm. Uh, their numbers, they just because they're the government, it's not going to make them right more often than experts that do this every day for a living. Well, they're much worse. Yeah, <laughs> much worse, Bill. <laughs> that reminds me of a company I call. It was they were publicly traded. They they, they were uh, established on government grants because they came up with an idea and they said, hey, "Government, yeah, that sounds good." <clears throat> and they made a real to life. Uh, like a uh, Ghostbusters backpack that shot out a, a plasma lightning bolt. <laughs> I mean, it literally worked. <laughs> but And what they were going to do with it was they were going to give it to uh, soldiers. They were going to shoot the opposing um, tanks, and instead of blowing up the tank, it's just going to fry all the electronics out of it. And uh, now anybody that was touching any of the metal inside the tank was probably going along with that. But the, uh, that was the idea. And they invested a lot of money in it. And when they went to display uh, the, how well it worked, not only did the lightning bolt miss the tank, it, it skipped over and hit one of the cars in the parking lot. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that was the end of that company. But uh, actually, they did try to make a comeback. They said, uh, well, look, we can control it in a confined space. So why don't we put these uh, cubicles that are open on two ends in hallways where people don't know they're there. And if somebody's not supposed to be somewhere, we'll zap them. <laughs> oh, that's a real life uh, practical use for that device. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you're talking about that, I, I get it. And uh, it's funny yeah, because if you get somebody who lobbies hard enough and, and has enough connections, you know, in fact, the, the only reason that, uh, well, one of the reasons that we have steel cable hanging up on all these telephone poles is all the steel companies benefited tremendously from having the ca- the cable up there to rest the other the uh, uh, the cables on, and they should have been buried. They should have been underground from the beginning. And uh, the United States is one of the uh, most advanced countries in the world, but it looks a lot like a third world country from the air when you see all those cables <laughs> that should be underground and in conduits where they're safer, where where a storm doesn't blow them down and knock your power out. The, uh, so that that was another government thing, and we're still suffering from that. And that was done in the early 1900s. So it's it's hard to get that stuff right, you know. Even even when you're a private firm, it's it's hard because uh, everybody's got their own ideas. I think I hear the music. We got to take another commercial break. Hey, you're listening to Mike Razor and Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. Stay tuned because we'll be right back. And we're back. Listen to Bill Bullington. I've had a special guest, Mike Razor. Uh, he is a um, attorney with a firm called uh, Cavett's Familia and Durkin. 
I can say that. Yeah, my mind's going in 10 different directions at the same time, by the way. And he's also, uh, did you say you're, um, I can't remember, the, the Stowe City Council. You're the president of the Stowe City Council? Sure. So I represent the entire city of Stowe, which is 35,000 people as an at-large member. And then city council itself elects a president to run the meetings and to sort of lead the body, and that's me. Oh, okay. And uh, so we're trying to talk him into <clears throat> becoming a state representative. <clears throat> <laughs> And he's got like, some really good ideas. So. There was an Indian rub burn you did, you applied to my arm yeah. in the last break. Uh, I guess, still, is that politically incorrect to say Indian rub burn? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. Th- things are changing so fast in yeah. today's world that you can't. I offend people sure. all the time. So it's just, <laughs> I just apologize in advance. Hey, if I say something that was dumb, I really didn't mean it. My, but, uh, my sincere apology to all the snowflakes out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, he's going to be. Uh, uh, we're going to try to get him to run for state representative. That should be pretty good, and uh, we'll keep uh, everybody posted on your your progress or your whatever your decisions are. And uh, appreciate you coming in today. Yeah, I've I've got a, a Facebook page that I, we've got um, four or five thousand people who follow. Oh, it's uh, Facebook dot com slash Razor Mike R A S O R Mike, and I'm on Twitter at m Razor zero two zero zero, and I've got a website Mike Razor dot com. So. Anyone who's interested, uh, more than welcome to to follow what we're doing in the future. Yep. And uh, it's exciting, though. I, I I think that there's a great opportunity for young people to get involved in politics and to make a meaningful change. And I'm not just talking about policy, poli- politics wise. I'm talking about the way we operate. You know, my generation, Bill, we're not we don't have the same like mentality that that the gen- that the boomers have. Uh, in, a, in approaching the opposite side. Like, I want to bring back the, the collegiality. I think that... When that, they work together, yeah. When they work together, but and outside the chambers, too. Like, Tip O'Neill was the first guy, first person in the hospital room to visit Ronald Reagan, and he's the Democrat Speaker of the House. Right. That, that's the kind of thing, you know, and, and, and at the county level and at the city level, I personally, some of my closer friends are Democrats, I don't see there's a reason why we can't bring that back at the state and the federal level. Yeah, there should be. That, and I agree completely. The uh, I really don't. I call myself a member of the decider party <clears throat> because I'm in that middle who uh, listens to both sides of the argument, and then I go with the one I think makes more sense. And you uh, know what? Truthfully, that's the way I am with in the ballot box. I'm not voting all Republicans because the, the nice thing about being in office is you get to meet people on both sides, and you get to know who they really are. Right. And, uh, you know— if if you happen to know anyone who's in government, any of your your listeners, call those people and ask them who to vote for because they likely personally know the people and can give you a very good description of who they are behind closed doors. Oh, well, that's a good idea. And I'm going to have to talk a little bit about uh, stocks here today. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. We could probably talk for a few more hours on politics, but let's get down to business here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people have been uh, watching, and uh, you know we have a, a seminar coming up. Uh, I think this seminar is going to be pretty good. Uh, I like it. I like the uh, uh, the topic. A lot of the research I've been doing lately. Uh, actually, it's been evolving. I'm I'm constantly reading and uh, trying to keep up with the changes. Um, sometimes it's not that obvious until it's uh, um, been around for a while, and that that's that's pretty normal. Uh, the uh, to, to get right into the, the very beginning of a trend. Trends start off kind of rough anyway, and kind of bumpy. Uh, eventually they start to pick up steam and that that's a, typically where I'll tend to notice things. And that's what we've been talking about for a few weeks. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about this probably for the next, uh, few months because in, in going forward, if it starts to change, and I don't know what the changes might be, but here, here's basically what's happened. There've been so many exchange traded funds that have been created just over the last, uh, five or six years that just about everything Every category that you can think of has a, a viable um, strategy. Now, there's one strategy that that I run. It's just like an exchange traded fund. It's it's a portfolio. Uh, it's quantitative, meaning I'm just using numbers the same way they are. And no one is ever going to be able to duplicate that one because they're so much bigger than I am. They're they're bigger than I am, and it's a momentum based strategy. We'll talk a little bit about that at the seminar. But one of the reasons that it, it's, it works like it does is because of the advent of all these funds. And there are a lot of funds that use momentum as one of the key factors in their stock selection process. So it's got an edge because I've, watched, I've been watching the new momentum funds 
Uh, in 2014, 2015, half of 2016, you'd wish you never heard of those, by the way, which is not uncommon uh, for that. It's uncommon for for novices or not just novices, but there are a lot of people who are value investors that are extremely sophisticated that never looked at this strategy because they didn't want it and they, they were uncomfortable for it from it from the very get go. So they didn't they never pursued it. That That's fine because uh, I was influenced by a lot of those guys earlier in my career. I didn't look at it until I was in the business for probably five, maybe six years. And uh, uh, because I'd seen some other people doing really, really well with it. And I wanted to know. So that's out there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, how you can incorporate that. But the, the main change is all these new funds. Now you can track them easily, more easily. And uh, uh, very simply, there's a uh, program I talk a lot about. And these guys should probably uh, sponsor my show, in fact. The uh, TC2000. Uh, so I pull up this stock, and th- this is Valiant. You heard a lot about this stock uh, because there were some big hedge funds that got into it. The stock crashed. Uh, the One of the funds was a mutual fund that it had a, still has a superb long-term track record, but had a huge position in Valiant, and it cost them losses, and they lost billions in assets and blah, blah, blah. But the uh, uh, bottom line is uh, companies like that are coming up now on these exchange traded funds and there I'm looking at this one and I'm counting there, there must be around 25 of them right now at least. Uh, and it's pretty, it's pretty wild when you see all these funds holding these stocks, it, it really explains a lot about their price movement, why it goes up as fast as it does, why it comes back down as fast as it does. And uh, when a, a, a fund that has to buy a stock based on its market value uh, gets involved with that stock and that stock price starts to go up, that fund has to buy that stock. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You're going to buy the stock because it says so in your prospectus and you published that and printed that and, and uh, submitted that to the entire world. Uh, and they know. <laughs> <laughs> the regulators know whether or not you're doing what you said you were going to do. Uh, and they're going to. So... A trend in motion tends to stay in motion uh, until it you get enough people on the other side. I mean, you might get some really sharp hedge fund guys that come up and say, hey, you know, this stock's overvalued. We're going to start shorting it now. If we can get it to go down X percentage, then the funds have to turn around and start selling it. And uh, and I'm telling you that that thought process goes through the minds of some really big money managers and always has. Yes. Yeah, so you get the the smarter money coming in at the edges, at the turning points, and then you get uh, a bunch of trends that are a result of that. And if you can uh, try to take advantage of that, um, if you can uh, just try to participate in it and manage your risk, and it's, uh, it's, it's not like gambling, it's like managing your risk, actually managing your risk very well. And I, I think it's uh, fascinating that uh, this has been happening in, uh, actually, I've I'm a little upset that it, it took me as long as it did to to catch on to that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's made it uh, a lot easier. And if you can identify these things, it's made it a lot easier. The other thing that's that's been real easy or easier, investing is never easy, by the way. Stocks are volatile. Uh, individual stocks can go through years of negative returns and then come up and, and put up an excellent return over a fairly short time period. And then people forget all the years that it was going sideways or was negative. The, um, that's just the way that, uh, market works, but the advent of all these funds has, has made it much more, uh, viable to create a truly diversified portfolio, truly diversified, um, in the old days. And actually this still goes on today. Uh, I'll have people come in and show me their portfolio. I know exactly how they picked the, the funds that they have It's because they went through a high performance period, they looked at that performance and extrapolated that out into the future. Hmm. Okay. And when I see the, that somebody has 15 funds and they're all holding the same stocks <laughs> <laughs> and they're wondering why it's so volatile, you know, and, and uh, when the market's going down, why they're doing so poorly. You know, it's because you don't have a real level of diversification. You've got to look behind the scenes. Uh, you have to know why the performance was as good as it was. And if you're going to invest in a diversified fashion, that means you're going to have some of your money in the areas that are not outperforming. They are not outperforming because the only other way to do that is, is, uh, or to be in the ones that are always outperforming is to follow the trends with the individual stocks. Like I was talking about earlier. And I was doing that with uh, ETFs 
uh, you can you can do that with funds, but it doesn't work like you want it to. It just works. It'll keep in the top 25% of all professional investors. And we're going to be talking about that stuff at this seminar coming up. Uh, it's the first one of the year. And it's, uh, I believe, I'm going to have to go to my website. I forgot to even uh, pull it up to find out what the date was. I think it's the 18th. And so if you go to BullingtonCapital.com, uh, you go to the seminar page, you'll be able to sign up for it there. There's no uh, cost to attend. Uh, seating is limited. We have 100 seats. And uh, it's at Tri-C's Corporate College, which uh, I've been going to for a long time and really like a lot. So, uh, again, you can just go to BullingtonCapital.com, sign up for that online. Again, there's no cost to attend. Uh, if you don't have a computer, you can always call us at 330-664-0700, 330-664-0700. Uh, and uh, the, the seminar is actually titled New Year, New Opportunities, New Risks. The uh, the opportunity, it's kind of like that uh, Newton's Law, which I'll have to wait until the next show to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, again, Mike Razor has been here. We're going to try to talk him into running for office. Thanks for coming in, Mike. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and uh, thanks to all you listeners out there. I'll uh, talk to you again next week. Good luck and good investing. God bless. You just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.